The NBC Children's Theater presents a story from E.B. White. Stuart Little, as read by Johnny Carson. When Mr. and Mrs. Frederick C. Little's second boy, Stuart, arrived, everybody noticed that he was not much bigger than a mouse. The truth of the matter was, he looked very much like a mouse. was only inches high, and he had a mouse's ears, a mouse's whiskers, a mouse's tail, and the pleasant, shy manner of a mouse. He not only looked like a mouse, but acted like one too, wearing a gray suit and carrying a small cane and fedora. Mr. and Mrs. Little named him Stuart, and Mr. Little made him a tiny bed out of four clothespins and a cigarette box. Stuart could climb lamps by shinning up the cord when he was only a week old. Every morning, Mrs. Little weighed him on a small scale, which was really meant for weighing letters. At birth, Stuart could have been sent by first-class mail for five cents, but his parents preferred to keep him rather than send him away. When at the age of a month, he had gained only one-third of an ounce, his mother was so worried she took him to the doctor for a checkup. The doctor was delighted with Stuart. He said it was very unusual for an American family to have a mouse. He listened to Stuart's heart with a stethoscope. And checked his temperature. It was 98.6, which is normal for a mouse. The doctor told Stuart to say, ah, so that he could inspect his tonsils. They were in good shape. Then the doctor looked into his ear solemnly with a flashlight. Not every doctor can look into a mouse's ears without laughing. Everything seemed to be just fine, and Mrs. Little was pleased to get such a good report. Feed him up, advised the doctor as they said goodbye. The home of the Little family was a pleasant place near a park in New York City. Stuart was a great help to his family because of his small size, and because he could do things that a mouse can do, and was agreeable about doing them. He was helpful when it came to ping pong. The Littles liked ping pong, but the balls had a way of rolling under things. Stuart soon learned to chase balls. It was great fun to see him pushing a ping pong ball. He had to throw his whole weight against it in order to keep it rolling. The Littles had a piano in their living room, which was all right, except that one of the keys was a sticky key and didn't work properly. Mrs. Little said she thought it must be the damp weather, yet the key had been sticking for five years during which time there had been many bright, clear days. Anyway, the key stuck and was a great inconvenience to Stuart when he wanted to play the piano. It bothered his brother George, too, particularly when he played the scarf dance. It was George who had the idea of stationing Stuart inside the piano. His job was to push the key up the second it was played. This was no easy task for Stuart, as he had to crouch down between the felt hammers so that he wouldn't get hit on the head. But Stuart liked it just the same. He would emerge quite deaf, as though he'd just stepped out of an airplane after a long journey. And it would be some little time before he really felt normal again. Mr. and Mrs. Little often discussed Stuart quietly when he wasn't around, for they had never quite recovered from the shock and surprise of having a mouse in the family. He was so very tiny, and he presented so many problems to his parents. Mr. Little said that, for one thing, there must be no unkind references to mice in their conversations or Stuart's reading. So Stuart always thought that the poem, "'Twas the night before Christmas, when all through the house not a creature was stirring, 
not even a mouse, went this way. It was the night before Christmas when all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a louse. Mr. Little made his wife tear from the nursery songbook the page about the three blind mice, see how they run. I don't want Stuart to get a lot of notions in his head, said Mr. Little. I should feel badly to have my son grow up in fear that a farmer's wife was going to cut off his tail with a carving knife. It is such things that make children dream bad dreams when they go to sleep at night. Stuart was an early riser. He touched his toes 10 times every morning to keep himself in good condition. He had seen his brother George do it, and George had explained that he kept the stomach muscles firm, and it was a fine abdominal thing to do. After exercising, Stuart would start for the bathroom, creeping silently down the long, dark hall and past the head of the stairs. Of course, the bathroom would be dark, too. But Stuart's father had thoughtfully tied a long string to the pull chain of the light. By grasping it as high as he could and throwing his whole weight on it, Stuart was able to turn on the light. He looked like a little old friar pulling the bell rope in an abbey, swinging on the string this way. To get up to the wash basin, Stuart had to climb a tiny rope ladder which his father had fixed for him. Now George had promised to build Stuart a small special wash basin, but George was always saying that he was going to build something and then forgetting about it. So Stuart just went ahead and climbed the rope ladder to the family wash basin every morning. To such a small fellow, the tasks of washing his face and hands and brushing his teeth presented many problems. Mrs. Little had provided him with a doll-sized washcloth and towel, cake of soap, toothbrush, and a doll's comb which he used for combing his whiskers. Turning the water on was no easy task for Stuart. I can hold on to the faucet all right, Stuart had complained, but I can't seem to turn it on because my feet keep slipping out from under me. So Stuart's father provided him with a very small hammer. And Stuart found that by swinging it three times around his head and letting it come down with a crash against the handle of the faucet, he could start a thin stream of water flowing, enough to brush his teeth anyway and moisten his washcloth. So every morning, the other members of the household, dozing in their beds, would hear the plink, plink of Stuart's hammer like a faraway blacksmith telling them that day had come. One fine morning, Stuart straddled the banister to slide downstairs and see what was doing. Nobody was around but Snowbell, the white cat belonging to Mrs. Little. Snowbell was another early riser. Stuart called, good morning to her. Hello, replied Snowbell sharply. You're up early, aren't you, Stuart? He looked at his watch and said, yes, it's only five minutes past six, but I felt good and I thought I'd come down and get a little exercise. Snowbell replied, I should think you'd get all the exercise you want up there in the bathroom, banging around, waking all the rest of us, trying to get that water started to brush your teeth. Your teeth aren't big enough to brush anyway. You want to see a good set? Look at mine. Very nice, said Stuart, but mine are all right too, even though they're small. I bet my stomach muscles are firmer than yours. I bet they're not, said the cat. I bet they are. They're like iron bands. I bet they're not, said the cat. Stuart glanced around the room to see what he could do to prove to Snowbell what good stomach muscles he had. He spied the drawn window shade with its cord and ring like a trapeze, and it gave him an idea. You can't do this, he called as he reached for the ring like a circus acrobat. Then a surprising thing happened. Stuart had meant to merely pull himself up, but he had taken such a hard jump it started the shade flying, dragging Stuart along with it and rolling him up inside so that he couldn't budge. Holy mackerel, said Snowbell, who was almost as surprised as Stuart Little. I guess that will teach him to show off his muscles. Help! Let me out, cried Stuart. But his voice was so weak that nobody heard. Snowbell just chuckled. She was not fond of Stuart. Instead of running upstairs and telling Mr. and Mrs. Little, she did a very curious thing. She glanced around to see if anybody was looking, then took Stuart's watch and cane to hide them in the pantry at the entrance to a mouse hole. When Mrs. Little found them, she gave a scream which brought everyone on the run. Stuart's down the mouse hole. They all called to him, Stuart, Stuart. When he didn't answer, Mrs. Little said he must be dead. If he is dead, said George, we ought to pull down the shades out of respect for the dead. 
George, shouted Mr. Little. If you don't stop, but George had already run into the living room. He pulled the shade and out dropped Stuart. Everybody wanted to know how it happened. It was simply an accident that might happen to anybody, said Stuart. As for my watch and cane, you can draw your own conclusions. One fine morning, Stuart put on his sailor suit and hat, took his spyglass and set out for a walk, full of the joy of life and the fear of dogs. He sauntered along Fifth Avenue, keeping a sharp lookout. When he saw two poodles, he hurried to the nearest doorman, climbed his leg and clung to his trousers till the danger was past. I'm not big enough to be noticed, thought Stuart. Yet I'm big enough to want to go to the sailboat pond in Central Park. When Stuart reached the wall that surrounds the pond, he gazed out at the ships through his spyglass. Over the pond, a light wind blew, and into the breeze sailed the single-masted sloops and schooners with two masts, their triangular white sails reflecting pyramids in the water. The owners, boys and grown men, raced around the cement shores, hoping to arrive at the other side in time to keep the boats from bumping. Some of the toy boats were not as small as you might think, for when you got close to them, you found that their mainmast was taller than a man's head. To Stuart, they seemed enormous. He hoped that he'd be able to get aboard one of them and sail away to the far corners of the pond. He was an adventurous little fellow and loved the feel of the great swell under him and the breeze in his face and the cry of the gulls overhead. As he stood gazing out at the ships through his spyglass, Stuart noticed one schooner that seemed to him finer and prouder than any other. Her name was Wasp. She had a long, sharp spoon bow, and on her foredeck, abaft the galley skylight, was a one-inch water cask. As Stuart peered up her beautifully rigged foremast, he realized that the entire ship was the ideal of applied art and was perfectly fitted for going to sea. She's the ship for me, thought Stuart. As she sailed in, Stuart hurried over to where she would be turned around. Excuse me, sir. Are you the owner of the schooner Wasp, said Stuart. I am, replied the man, surprised to be addressed by a mouse in a sailor suit. Stuart continued, I'm looking for a berth in a good ship and I thought you might sign me on. Are you sober? asked the owner of the Wasp. I do my work, said Stuart crisply. The man looked sharply at him. He couldn't help admiring the trim appearance and bold manner of this diminutive seafaring fellow. Well, he said, I'll tell you what I'll do with you. You see that big racing sloop over there? That's the Lillian B. Womrath, and I hate her with all my heart. Then so do I, cried Stuart loyally. I hate her because she is always bumping into my boat, continued the man, and because her owner is a lazy boy who doesn't understand sailing and who hardly knows a deck from a dock. Or a mast from a mist, cried Stuart. Or a jib from a jibe, bellowed the man. But hold on. I'll tell you what I'll do. The Lillian B. Womrath has always been able to beat the wasp sailing. But if my schooner were handled properly, it would be a different story. So, my young friend, I'll let you sail the wasp across the pond. And if you beat the Womrath, I'll give you a regular job. Aye, aye, sir, said Stuart. And he swung himself aboard the schooner, taking his place at the wheel. Stuart called, I'll race the wasp straight and true. Bravo, cried the man, and good luck go with you. Well, by the by, you haven't told me your name. Name is Stuart Little, called Stuart at the top of his lungs. I'm the second son of Frederick C. Little of this city. Then he spun the wheel over smartly and headed his schooner toward the starting line. When the people in Central Park learned that one of the toy boats was being steered by a mouse in a sailor suit, they all came running. A naval officer announced that everybody would have to stop pushing, but nobody did. People in New York liked to push each other. The most excited person of all was the boy who owned the Lillian B. Womrath. Come back here and get on my boat, he cried. I want you to steer my boat. Thank you for your kind offer, called Stuart, but I'm happy aboard the Wasp, and continued toward the starting line. I'll be the referee, said a man in olive green pants. Is the Wasp ready? Ready, sir, called Stuart. 
Is the Lillian B. Womrath ready? Sure, I'm ready, said Leroy. All right, said the referee. To the north end of the pond. On your mark. Get set. Go. And away went the two boats for the north end of the pond. This is the life for me, Stuart murmured to himself. What a ship. What a day. What a race. High overhead seagulls wheeled and cried. Taxi cabs tooted and honked from 72nd Street. And the wind, which had come halfway across America to get to Central Park, whistled in the rigging and blew spray across the decks. Before the two boats had gone very far, Stewart noticed something happening on shore. The people were pushing each other harder to see the sport, and although they didn't really mean to, they pushed the officer right into the pond. The wave he made went curling outward, cresting and billowing. When Stewart saw the great wave approaching, towering above the wasp like a mountain, he reached for the rigging, but he was too late. The wave swept him into the water where everybody supposed he would drown. But Stuart kicked with his feet and thrashed with his tail, and in a minute or two, climbed back aboard the schooner and took his place at the helm. He could hear people cheering, Add a mouse, Stuart! Add a mouse! This race isn't over yet, thought Stuart, as he saw the Lillian bees sailing on course close by. Suddenly, a dark cloud swept across the sun, leaving the earth in shadow. Dirty weather ahead, sir, Stuart called out to the wasp's owner on shore. Never mind the weather, cried the owner. Watch out for flotsam dead ahead. Stuart saw nothing but gray waves ahead, then glanced behind him. There came the Lillian B gaining steadily. Look out, Stuart. Look out where you're going. Right in the path of the wasp, Stuart saw an enormous paper bag. He spun the wheel over, but it was too late. The wasp had driven her bowsprit straight into the bag, slowed down and came up into the wind with all sails flapping. Just at that moment, Stuart saw the bow of the Lillian plow through his rigging. The wasp couldn't move because of the bag, and the Lillian couldn't move because her nose was stuck in the wasp's rigging. The boats were in a terrible tangle. Then Stuart heard the voice of the wasp owner yell, Stuart! Stuart, down jib, down staysail. Cut away all paper bags. Back your foresail and sailor full and by. Stuart did all these things, and slowly the wasp rolled her rail out from under the Lillian's nose and shook herself free. The Lillian went off in a wild direction. A loud cheer for Stuart went up from the bank. Stuart turned to the wheel and answered it. Then as the wasp heeled over with the wind, Stuart sailed her straight and true toward the finish line. Stuart was proud and happy, happier than he'd ever been before in all his life. After he had crossed the finish line, Stuart was highly praised for his fine seamanship and daring. The wasp owner said it was the happiest day of his life. In private life, he was Dr. Paul Carey, a surgeon dentist, he said and he would be delighted to have Stuart take command of his vessel at any time. Everybody shook hands with Stuart. Everybody, that is, except the naval officer, who was too wet and mad to shake hands with a mouse. <laughs>